Not nearly as cool as Steve just made it sound, but uh, <laughs> I do appreciate that. Um, yeah, so first and foremost, thanks so much for sticking around for the very end. I was secretly really pumped when I was told I was like presenting basically very last on the third day. It's like a smaller room. Um, so you guys can bear with me for 15 or 20 minutes. Hopefully, if, if nothing else, you'll uh, passionately agree or passionate, passionately disagree with me. We can, we can talk about it a little bit. Um, so before I get really annoying and talk to you for the next 20-ish minutes, um, Steve kind of summarized it pretty well. I manage growth at the Farmer's Dog. Um, so growth for us is first and foremost how we retain our customers. Um, everything about how you grow as a business is way more efficient when you have really strong retention. And so we've always been a very retention first business. We always will be. Um, also, like, we get more dog picks when we retain better. So it's like a really a win-win. Um, and then after that is how we acquire you know, customers and really, really scale the business um, and then monetize higher AOVs, things like that. Uh, most importantly, this is my dog. I'm going to be honest, I included that slide just so I could get that reaction of people going, oh. Um, her name's Amelia Ginny Evans. We'll talk about why her name's Ginny a little bit later, but she's the best. I mean, she's the reason why we do what we do. Um, for those of you who own a dog, you know, you think about them as a family member. And so it's a really interesting thing, right, that trusting your dog's food is such a huge part of your relationship with your dog. Dogs love you the most when you feed them. It's how they're hardwired. It's their survival instinct. Um, so the choices you make about their health and well-being in regards to food are, are really big decisions. And we, think, we take that responsibility very uh, differently than a lot of companies. Um, so the way our company was founded, it was uh, two co-founders, Brett and Jonathan. Uh, this is Brett with his dog, Jada. She's absolutely amazing. And so what happened is when Brett was living in Florida, he adopted Jada. And for like the first two years of Jada's life, she was just crazy sick. Um, I'm glad we're not eating anymore, but basically like vomiting every day, crazy diarrhea. Like he'd have to roll up the rugs in his apartment when he left home. Um, and for anyone who has a dog or even a human child, that's like an incredibly hard thing, right, for someone, like a family member to be constantly sick. Um, so at the time, he tried literally every single pet food on the market, basically. Like, he, he has this picture of his closet, and it's like all pet food bags. Um, and none of them were helping Jada's symptoms. So he ended up going to a holistic vet who recommended that he try home cooking for her. And it's really interesting, because when you talk to vets and you say, oh, my dog has XYZ digestive issue, their first two things are they'll switch their food or start home cooking for them. Um, so we went home, at the time he was feeding blue buffalo, which if you guys are familiar is like four or five times the price of like an IAMS. So we thought this is a super expensive pet food, they must be using super amazing ingredients. And he literally just looked at the label and like the ingredients he could understand, like it said there's turkey in here, there's sweet potatoes, there's carrots. He uh, just cooked that fresh and fed it to Jada. Um, and within like a couple days, she was a totally different dog. She stopped vomiting, she stopped having diarrhea. Um, over the course of two months, her coat completely changed colors. She had like higher energy levels. And so this really led him on to an investigation of like, what, how come when I take these ingredients off of this bag and just cook them fresh, there's like this totally different reaction in my dog. And it's really funny, because when you think about it, the pet food industry has been marketed the exact same way for literally a century. They show you a picture of this really beautiful slice of beef, or chicken, carrot, kangaroo in some cases. Um, and then they show you this beautiful vegetable. And then at the end, it's like, wait, what happened to those ingredients that now they're these brown balls, right? Like, it doesn't make any sense, literally. Um, and so what's really interesting about that is if you look at pet food advertising, it's literally everyone does it. It's insane. There's these like fresh vegetables falling in the background. In this case, there's a sunflower for reasons I don't totally understand. Um, and then it ends up in these brown balls. And it, this one, they like have orange specks on them. And you're like, is that a, is that a carrot? Uh, like what happens in this process? And it's the same, like these are my favorite. Like there's a farmer and he grabs a potato out of the ground and then he like slams down a big fresh cut of salmon. And then it's a brown ball. It's like, okay, I don't get this. And then, sorry, last one, it's just it's so ubiquitous. You know, there's a truck, and it has all this fresh produce in the back, and this is like the one I'm talking about, where in this case, it's a fresh cut of salmon, and that looks like a lamb chop, these beautiful carrots and peas. And at the end, I mean, these are brown triangles, so I guess it's a little bit different. Um, but right, there's something like endemic in this process that everyone talks about these amazing ingredients, and they don't actually end up in the end product. Uh, so really what we do is very, very simple. Um, we just literally do what everyone says they've been doing, and we just do it. So we take real food, like real meat, real veggies, and it comes out in the bowl. And it, you can actually see the ingredients, and it's just cooked fresh. So we say we're a human-grade company, and that doesn't mean that like, we expect you to eat the food. Um, you could. It doesn't taste very good. It's not designed for humans. Uh, but what that just means is we're opting into a much higher standard. Uh, we're opting into a standard that means we could cook the food for humans. Because uh, what pretty much every kibble company is doing, if they tried to put it on human shelves, they would be shut down and sued and go bankrupt because they don't do any of the things, basically, that their advertising leads you to believe. Um, so that's what we are. And so when we think about things like personalization or kind of the tactics we use in marketing, I'm preaching to the choir here, but we start with our brand truths and then we take it from there. And so we kind of do a fairly straightforward brand exercise, right, of we believe the world would be a better place if. 
and that comes down to every dog could live their best life, right? And so this gets really powerful when you break it down a little bit. The first part of that is every dog. And so that means dogs that are our customers, our prospective customers, dogs that will never be our customers. Every dog should be living their best life, and that's really important to us. Could live is really important because inherent in could live is the idea of choice. You have a choice about how you can live your best life. So in my case, I would probably be healthier if I drank a little less beer, I ate less bacon. But that's a choice that I make. Um, in the terms of your dog, it's really interesting because they'll eat whatever you put in front of them. And so you have a choice that you can make for your dog and for their health and well-being. Their best is really interesting, and this is where actually we get into the personalization aspects a bit. Best means something different for every single person and for every single dog. Every single dog is unique. Every single dog-human relationship is unique. Um, my best life is probably like in a cabin in the woods in Colorado with nobody else around, like reading a book. Um, some, yeah, with my dog, of course. Uh, <laughs> someone else's best life might be on a beach. I hate the beach. I get really sunburned. Um, it's not for me. And so this idea of their best is completely unique to every single customer. And then life is right what we're all here to do. And so the reason you get a pet in the first place is to have this amazing companion in your life. Um, and so when you kind of roll this all together, right, this is, this is a big promise we're making, right, that we're going to enable the world to give every dog could live their best life. And so what's funny is a lot of the interest we get in the interest industry is around the things that we're, that we're doing with technology and the things we're doing with personalization. And the reality is that's just such a small part of what we do. Like their best life is this one part of our brand promise. And personalization is just a teeny little tool of how we like bring this to life. And so what's really funny is I get where all the interest comes from, right, is it seems like every single advertising article lately has been like really <laughs> touting personalization at scale and how impactful it is and how it's going to change everything you do in your marketing. And I don't know about you guys, but I kind of I feel like it's been built up as like the second coming of like the marketing messiah or something. It's insane. It's like you need to stop marketing and just personalize it so it's right message, right time, right person and everything. And I mean, not that personalization isn't a power tool, but it's not your entire brand truth and it's not going to solve everything. There's things that are more important than being able to personalize someone's first name or a dog's name into an email. Um, so it's so much more. And so it's a kind of weird example, but I like to use the example of like books and movies. Um, so I'm a really big Harry Potter fan. I'm a Ravenclaw. That's why I'm so nerdy. Um, and if you think about Harry Potter, right, it was this cultural phenomenon. J.K. Rowling became like the most wealthy woman in the world. And the reason Harry Potter was so impactful is because it was a shared truth that everyone can interpret in their own way. Everyone has a different idea of Harry. Ginny is my favorite character in the books. That's why my dog's middle name is Ginny. Um, Harry Potter wasn't personalized. If it was like a pick your own adventure, it would have been horrible. <laughs> Um, and so if you even think about your own books and movies, you don't love them, you don't love these cultural phenomena because they're personalized perfectly for you. They're a shared experience that you can have across cultures, across races, across genders. And that's where it gets really powerful. Um, and so when we think about personalization, it's really interesting that the reason Steve said I don't really believe in this term personalization and scale is because I, I really do believe it's an inherent dichotomy. And so same as our brand promise, if you break it down, the very first part of personalization is personal. And I think we skip over that a lot when we talk about it. Because the idea of a personal relationship is that it's infinitely nuanced and it's very complex. So the way I talk to my best friend is totally different than I talk to someone who I might have known in high school I haven't seen in a couple years. And in fact, that friend from high school, if I like ran up, gave them a hug, and told them what I ate for dinner last night, they'd probably be like, whoa, dude, like, tell me what you did in the last five years first, and maybe why are you hugging me? Um, and so the idea of a personal relationship right, is that it's completely unique. It's just like that idea of their best life. It's totally unique. And so then when you kind of look at personalization, when you take personal first, you realize it's just a tool. It's just one small part of how you build a personal relationship. And then at scale, right, the very concept of scale, which we've talked at endless amounts at, at this conference, is that you can do something with the same or similar efficiency one time as you can do it a million times. So you spend $100 in marketing, you spend a million dollars in marketing, hopefully your CPA is the same, if not better. Right? That's the idea of scale. And so when I look at this, I see these two things in complete dichotomy and complete conflict with each other. How can you have truly unique personal relationships with millions and millions of people, right? Like, I think we're lying to ourselves if we think that that's really the end goal, like the golden grail of marketing. How could you possibly have such a nuanced relationship that with millions of people you have a truly personal relationship? And so I think when you kind of take that impetus off of, like, we have to personalize every single thing we do for every single person, you pivot to thinking about how can we just use personalization to influence personal relationships. And so we talk about this as in a sense of like moments that matter, right? And this isn't like a unique term. I mean, there's a little speaker earlier this week who uses the same term. But the idea of a moment is that it's an opportunity to build a personal relationship. And the idea of moments that matter is that they matter not only to the consumer or the user, or the customer, or whatever you call them, but they all matter to you as a business. So it's a two-way street. It's like an agreement. And that's where like 
not every brand is gonna be ubiquitous in every single part of a person's life. For us, we're really prevalent in how they feed their dog, but they probably don't care to hear about us about like, what we think is going on in pop culture. You know, that's not like, we don't have permission from our customers to talk about that. And so when you think about moments that matter, you kind of get to take the weight off of this idea of personalization at scale, and you just get to pick some moments that are really, really important. And so I figured the best way to do this would kind of just like walk you through what an average life cycle looks like at the farmer's dog. Whoops, this is an old one, <laughs> whatever. Um, so in your first box, right, you get a personalized feeding guide. So you go through the site and you fill out a whole bunch of information about your dog. And what's funny is we don't do that just so that we can send like personalized marking. We actually do that so we can make the product itself. So if you're coming to us, we're pro solving a problem. And the thing we need to solve is like your dog needs a better food. And so if your dog's a little bit overweight, we need to adjust their calories, things like that. And so your personalized feeding guide is huge to having you have a better experience. And then there's customized food based on your dog's profile. So the underrated part here is that Aspen, in this case, is eating 504 calories of food a day. And so that pack of food has exactly 504 calories in it. Um, and then you also get a personalized transition guide. And so when you actually zoom in on the pack, right, this is like where personalization comes into play. We're running a whole lot of fairly sophisticated stuff here. Uh, where you have the dog name. This isn't personalized just because we wanted to do personalization. If you have a multi-dog household, you need to know which dog gets which food. Um, you have the portion sizes that each dog feeds. You have the human that ordered it, and then you have the stuff that's cooked on. And so these are just like little teeny building blocks we use, right, and to start building a relationship. So since this is our very, their very first order with us, I kind of see us as like friends on the bleacher in high school. Like we just met, and like we're still kind of awkward. We haven't really, like we're not best friends yet. And so it wouldn't make sense for us to like pretend that we're best friends right now. We know they're kind of just taking us for a spin. And so then Later on, this is how we start to build a personal relationship. Um, so then in sort of your first week on the trial, we send you a text that says, hey, Crystal, it's Adrian from the farmer's dog, save our number. Wanted to check in and see how your first few meals are going. Is Aspen enjoying the food or the portion sizes okay? All right, so now we're kind of like friends, we're texting. And so this is also really cool because it's an opportunity for us to understand how their dog is doing on the food, potentially to overcome any issues they have. But also this is a really underrated touch point because if you think about it, if you go to the store and buy something like a blue buffalo, a premium kibble, and your dog gets sick, their first instinct isn't to text Blue Buffalo and ask them like what's going on. Your very first instinct is probably to text a friend or to text your vet, both of which are really bad experiences, frankly. <laughs> and so for us, what's really interesting about this touch point is it plants the seed in our customers that like, oh, like there's someone out there that cares about my dog just as much as me. And any problem that comes up, whether it's with the food or whether all of a sudden I have to go out of town on business, um, I, can, I have someone to text. I can text Adrian, I can text Casey. Every one of our customers has a person at the farmer's dog that they know they can text. And so this is where we get the idea of a true personal relationship, right? We found this moment that's really, really important, and we're literally putting them in touch one-on-one -on -one with a human. And so it's actually really funny. John from Media Post last night was like, oh, yeah, um, my box went missing. He's a farmer's dog customer. And he's like, and I texted Casey. Like, is she going to get back to me? And I was like, that's so funny that you know Casey's name. Yeah, she will get back to you. <laughs> and so it's so funny that, like, the outreach we get from this is just insane. Like, people go crazy for this idea that, oh my God, there's a person at the farmer's dog I can talk to about my dog's food. And this, the response from our customers is absolutely crazy. Um, and so what we do is we find, this is just an example of one of the moments, but throughout a customer's life cycle, we do a lot of looking at these kind of really important moments. And some of the stuff we do entirely behind the scenes, the customer has no idea we're doing it. Some of it's more explicit like this text. And we think about how do we start to build a personal relationship? Sorry, this is an old deck. Um, so it's really funny is uh, there's actually a bit of an example that I wanted to walk through. I thought I had a slide for it, but I'm sorry. Um, so about a month ago, we had a customer email, like write this crazy long review online. It was like a five paragraph essay. And it was all about how amazing the farmer's dog was. And she specifically said, she's like, my favorite person to talk to at the farmer's dog is Matt. Matt is always making sure my dog's food is on time. We actually call him Uncle Matt. And we were like, whoa, like, what's this? And then when we actually dug into it, there's like a lot of these things that they, people say, like, especially when they've been customers for like 12 months or a year, 14 months, two years, that they really do start to see us as family. And I mean, part of it's hyperbole, but all hyperbole is based in truth. So we've gone from this like awkward people sitting next to each other on the bleachers, like just giving the food a try. And then just by focusing on these moments that matter and understanding our role in our customers' lives, they begin to see us as true friends and allies in their dog's health, which becomes really, really powerful, right? And so it'd be one thing if I was standing up here talking about all this and our customers didn't feel the same, right? Then I'm just a, a guy on stage talking about nonsense. But the reality is our customers really do feel like they're building personal relationships with us. And so what gets exciting is in, instead of thinking about, oh my God, we're gonna personalize every single touch point for every single variant at infinite scale, at infinite complexity, we just have to say, what are the touch points that really, really matter and how do we do those really effectively? And it's a much more manageable task. And so, uh, I always get emotional when I talk about this one, so I'll apologize in advance. But um, 
Like dogs don't live forever, it really sucks. A huge part of our mission, this idea of every dog could live their best life, is creating a world where dogs do live longer. Um, and so I wanted to highlight this touch point because it's super interesting to me that we do no personalization here. There, there's literally nothing, right? Like insert first name here, default, hey there. Um, but what we do is when a dog unfortunately does pass away, whether they're a current customer, they're a former customer, whether they're a prospective customer who's nev never ordered the food before and they just tell us their dog's passed away, um, we send flowers. And I think what's interesting about that is if, if you think about it in terms of a personal connection, this makes total sense, right? If you had a family member that had a loved one that passed away, you wouldn't send them a generic comfort, like cancellation email that's like, hey, we've canceled your account, right? That's like, it's so disingenuous. But so if you think about it of we actually have a personal relationship and we're working on a mission to build these relationships, this makes a lot of sense. From an economic standpoint, it makes no sense, right? This is essentially a customer that has churned. They're never gonna order from us again unless they get another dog and we're sending them a very expensive gift of flowers, right? But if you really focus on the personal relationships instead of this idea of we're gonna drive crazy efficiency with uh, personalization at scale, it all just begins to make a whole lot more sense to me. Um, and so there's actually a quote that I've been thinking about a lot lately from Rory Sutherland, who's the, um, he's the chair of the UK arm of Ogilvy. He wrote an article the other week that said, efficient advertising um, can find customers, but effective advertising can create customers. And I think that's a really interesting thing, and especially in what we've talked about the last couple of days, I've been kind of really trying to challenge myself to think about that, because I don't know when it kind of happened, but it feels like in the last five years or maybe 10 years, we've pivoted so much into thinking about efficiency and finding people who are already very, very likely to check out and right message, right place, right time. Personalization at scale, I see very much as part of that, that we've kind of stopped thinking about what's effective marketing. Why would I find 1,000 very likely converters when I could convince 100,000 people that we're doing something amazing? And so that's where I see building personal relationships, not as this like crazy amount of efficiency. I see it as looking at our entire growth model and knowing that when we build something really special and make special connections, we're much more effective. We might not always be more efficient, but we're always more effective when we focus on personal relationships instead of just efficiency. <laughs> um, and we're gonna skip through all of this. Um, that's kind of the end, I'm sorry. Uh, that was an old deck. <laughs> but, I did realize my founders might be on the live stream, so I'm probably gonna get in a whole lot of trouble for this, um, and this is also old, but we don't discount trials. Um, sometimes we do 50% discount, sometimes we do 20, um, but I went ahead and set up a link for you guys for a free trial, if you want. Um, I'm really hoping they're not listening, I'm gonna get in a lot of trouble. It's uh, thefarmersdog.com forward slash uh, TFDX Adrian. Um, I can send it to you guys, but I firmly believe that like, and I loved the, the example from Keynes earlier of you can say a lot, but it's really what you do. Um, and so I guess my idea of giving you guys a free trial is it's me putting, putting my money where my mouth is. Um, if you give it a go um, and you really don't feel like we made an honest effort to build a personal relationship with you over those first couple weeks, um, let me know and I need to do a better job at my job. But uh, I really appreciate you guys letting me tell the brand story. It's, it's been a lot of fun this week. Anybody, any, any, any questions for Adrian? Questions? I got you. Hold on, hold on. Hi, I'm Stephen Ryan with Trendline Interactive here in Austin. Um, great presentation, Adrian. Thank you. Love it. Love the whole thing. Um, although yours is a unique business model, and so I'm interested to know, as you scale, how are you going to continue to personalize from a meal-by-meal -meal basis, as, you know, production and everything else? Because outside of marketing, you've got to keep up with production. So what's the plan there? Sorry, so is the question how we're going to continue to personalize our production? No. So, you know, obviously you're... Uh, your business model is you're, you're producing customized meals for each and every customer, for each mm -hmm. and every dog. So as you scale, um, is that something that concerns you? I mean, how many customers do you have now and how many customers do you plan on having and do you continue to personalize each and every meal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can't share how many customers we have right now. Um, our venture capital firms would kill me. <laughs> but I think what's really interesting is we don't think of personalization as actually um, like being restrictive to scale. Um, if anything, actually because the way we cook the food to meet demand, we're more efficient in cooking food than let's say a commercial pet food company. Um, and so it's actually a fairly straightforward step in our supply chain that basically as the packs come out, they just get printed on, right? So there's some pretty crazy technology going on behind the scenes, which is why we've built everything from our front end site to our CRM to actually sort of the production capacity on the back end in house. Um, and so it's also just such an important moment because every dog is unique. And so to actually optimize a dog's health to be perfect for them, you, you have to personalize it. Um, 
86% of dogs in America are overweight, and that's in part because the feeding guides aren't personalized, and so the kibble companies just tell you to feed sort of at the top end of the range, um, being one use case. So, I mean, the short answer is no. That could be nearsighted of me, but I don't think we'll be changing that anytime. I have two quick questions. Mm -hmm. Take us into the back end of that, um, for that, that text message, that post by text message. What's happening there? Is that me is the initial message automated, and then it gets handed off? If there's a if there's a, a very uh, personal response, is, mm -hmm. is that then handed off to a human responder? How does yeah. that actually work on the back end and being staffed? Yeah, and so this is part of what I mean. Of we've invested really, really heavily in retention, and so like obviously retention, you don't put a whole lot of paid media behind, but you put a lot of technology solutions and stuff. So basically, we use a customer data platform that, that we really like, um, and so actually this is running a fair amount of pretty complex personalization. So if you actually look at like the raw code, it's like a million different Django templates because obviously the grammar in some of this doesn't make sense if it's multiple dogs. Um, if you, your dog has a specific issue, like if they're overweight, um, we need to ask a different question about portion sizes, et cetera. Um, so yeah, that's where like personalization is just a little tool. Um, and so the first message is automated and then we just do a, not even super complex, but a, a pretty tricky little trick so that um, when they respond, it goes directly into our CX workflow, and so an agent is responding in real time. Um, and, and then, what are the other moments that you're looking at? So we saw two moments, the post-buy moment, the uh, end-of-life moment. Uh, what in between is another moment that you're already play playing with or thinking about? Yeah, I mean, there's tons, right? And that's kind of where it gets at the idea of also moments aren't equal for everyone. Um, so for example, for certain dogs, um, birthday cards are really, really impactful, and so we handwrite a birthday card to the dog. Um, in certain cases, um, like if a customer has had a really tricky shipping situation, like in the summer it gets to like 120 degrees in Arizona, it's absolutely insane, it's so hard to ship perishable food to Arizona, um, then those are moments where we identify there's sort of an opportunity. And so what's really interesting is if you look at most of like the churn modeling, in the world, it's gonna say anytime someone talks to a CX agent, that's a risk for churn because they're unhappy about something. And, and we see the better, actually the opposite. Like the more they're talking to CX agents, the better their retention is. Um, and so that's where the, the kind of question comes in is like, it's not just like a generic moment that we can scale across everybody. It's, it's being smart about either rolling things into cohorts that we know is true or identifying parts of the experience that are as much gut as data-based, if that makes sense. So, so things moments like moments themselves are personalized in essence. Yeah. yeah. Adrian's, oh, hold on, we have one more, more here. Go ahead. Eric with Beard Brand. Uh, the question I have is a, a lot of these marketing initiatives like the flower also have like a significant operational component to it. Like how do you push these marketing, are they marketing driven initiatives or are they operational driven initiatives to, to where you can really tie that together and make sure you deliver that experience? Yeah, I mean most of, Everything we do, at least from a life cycle point of view, which is a lot of what I talked about today and really where the personalization comes into play is, is CX driven. Um, our customer experience team knows way more about the customers. They interact with them every single day and they know way more about like the pain points in their experience than like I managing the marketing function could ever hope to know, if we're honest. Um, and I realize that can sometimes be a bit of a hot take. Um, so a lot of that's driven by them of these are categorical ways we know and will improve the experience. Um, and then yeah, there's, there's an operational component, but actually like the flowers is, it's funny, it's like the most scalable thing ever. Um, our only limit would be how many flowers are in the world, I guess, um, versus something like an SMS, actually, even though it's completely automated and kind of more straightforward, is a little more difficult to like scale, let's say, if we have 100 million customers or something down the line. Does that answer your question? Nice. <laughs> well, Adrian can answer more questions in the round table that he's gonna host on, uh, on CRM personalization at the, uh, right now. Uh, so please thank Adrian Evans. I, thought, I don't think I overhyped that at all. <laughs> uh, that was really cool. We're